Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Are you ready, Jenny? Look at that. No, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay man. We got okay. this. We got this. Okay. All right, man. It's okay. All right. Ah, let go. Let go. What you are watching is the Bear County Sheriff releasing body cam footage of the deadly shooting of combat veteran Damian Daniels by Deputy John Rodriguez in August of last year. They released it just short this this afternoon. It was actually released just a half an hour after Bear County grand jury decided not to indict Rodriguez Deputy Rodriguez in this case. Rodriguez, one of the deputies responding to ment a mental health call involving Daniels. That video from different body cameras shows deputies trying to restrain Daniels using a taser on him several times, telling him to get to the ground. Video shows deputies taking what appears to be a knife from Daniels. Daniels continues to struggle. The deputies can be heard telling him to get on the ground and quote, don't you do it. It looked like the taser was used on him time and time again. Much of what happened during the struggle is out of frame or so close. What Daniels is struggling with or trying to do is not clear. During the struggle, deputy, you can hear them command their commands intensify as it appears Daniels is trying to do something. Then there are two shots. The grand jury's decision today to no bill means there was not enough evidence in the case they thought to indict Rodriguez. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez in a statement saying in part, quote, every officer involved shooting in Bear County resulting in serious injury or death will be decided by a grand jury. Of course, that's a story we'll continue to follow. As if hotels didn't take a big enough hit during the pandemic shutdowns, they're now dealing with fallout from the supply chain crisis. These issues even more visible as hotels fill up for the holidays and events like the NCAA Alamo Bowl game here in San Antonio. And Courtney Friedman explains what things are being held up and how that affects you, the customer. The supply chain crisis is adding insult to injury for the hotel industry. We don't have the supplies that we need just to operate on a day-to-day -day standpoint. Shampoo, conditioner, lotions, soaps, hand towels. Tom Green is the president of Presidian Hotels and Resorts, a group of 14 hotels, 13 in South and Central Texas. He says supplies are taking months longer to come in if they're available at all. These lamps were ordered last year and just got here to the Estancia del Norte Hotel in San Antonio last month. Staff shortages mean no room service and housekeeping only upon request. And it's not just the rooms that are affected, it's also the restaurants. Food is so much more expensive that they've had to remove things from the menu and the prices have had to increase. Plus, this restaurant can't be fully staffed right now, so this dining area is only open for breakfast and private parties. For City and Director of Strategic Initiatives, Philip Lawson says material and labor shortages have also made renovating and building hotels close to impossible. Companies in China or elsewhere don't want to ship because the ports are backlogged. And then once it gets in the port and they offload it, there's not enough trucks, truck drivers and chassis to actually deliver it. The railways are backed up. So they're getting creative, finding other material brands that are available and leaning on other hotels inside and outside their own company. We're having to go to other groups and say, hey, we need help in this arena. Can you help us with these supplies? And they'll say, yeah, we can do that. But do you have these supplies? And we'll say, sure. The beauty of South Texas communities in times of crisis. We've raised prices, but not at a level that I would say is significant for the customer as of yet. Green knows that could change as the crisis drags on, but he's keeping faith in the resiliency and grit of the service industry. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. A gunfire outside a nightclub just north of downtown finding a target in someone who actually worked there. San Antonio police say the man that was shot following some sort of disturbance, he had no part in. Officers found him in the 1500 block of North Main near Evergreen Street. But as Katrina Weber tells us, police are still looking for that shooter. The cold weather outside didn't help at all to cool tempers that San Antonio police say originally flared up inside Heat nightclub. They say two groups of people involved in a fight there around 1130 last night continued their battle after leaving the business. Security guards intervened both times. Still, the trouble didn't end there. Police say someone drove up with a gun in the 1500 block of North Main and fired toward the club, hitting a worker carrying a bottle of water to one of the guards. Based on what police tell us, the man who was shot had nothing to do with any of the trouble, and they believe that bullet likely was meant for someone else. The victim, though, ended up being rushed to a hospital. 
At the time, police said his wound may be life-threatening. Later, a co-worker told us that man was shot in the leg. One of the guards fired back at the shooter who sped away in a car. Although some of this may have been caught on surveillance cameras, police have not made any arrests yet. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. If you're shopping for an electric scooter, a bike, or a hoverboard this holiday season, the Better Business Bureau has a warning. Go Tracks, it's a North Texas-based company that offers steep discounts for these in-demand electric products. Well, customers report buying the products on the company's website and on Amazon, on average, spending about $200 for a Go Tracks product. But the Better Business Bureau says that hundreds of customers have reported not receiving a product or getting a faulty one. That's another reason why I went with that company because they have adult scooters. Like you see downtown when they're, they're right there, it was that kind of scooter. Electric, all that. It had a speedometer, a headlight, a radio, you know, it was a nice scooter. So, yeah, I, I'll just probably look into another company this time. Tanisha Nixon paid nearly $300 for a faulty electric scooter. She hasn't heard back from the company either. As of right now, the Better Business Bureau reports 286 complaints from GoTrax customers. It's something they've been working at for a while. New at 6 San Antonio can now boast it has a Tier 1 university, one of only eight in Texas. UTSA last week earned what's known as Carnegie Tier 1 status, the highly coveted designation based on UTSA's level of research activity and the number of doctoral degrees it is awarded. Jesse DeGregato tells us the prestige of having Tier 1 status attracts high caliber students and faculty and more funding to do more research. It's said UTSA's achieving Tier 1 status speaks to its continued emphasis on research as well as its doctoral degrees. It makes us a public research intensive institution with societal impact. Being among the nation's top Tier 1 universities, he says will help attract more of the students and faculty who made it possible. We want to recruit the best and brightest, so the designation is going to further uh, uh, expand our reach. For instance, in cybersecurity, a field of worldwide concern. UTSA's new Tier 1 status, on top of having the state's first school of data science under construction, they say could bolster San Antonio's standing as Cyber City USA. The $90 million facility, the first new building in UTSA's expansion downtown, will bring together a diversity of expertise by faculty and students. All of this adds to the, the uh, multi-dimensional additive effect of, of really being bold and, and really going after and solving some of the big societal problems. Also, when it comes to the biosciences, he says Tier 1 status will give UTSA the opportunity to further its collaborations, like with Texas Biomed. We really are at an inflection point. Our research portfolio is going to continue to grow. Jesse De Oyedo, KSAT 12 News. A multi-million dollar renovation underway at the historic Alameda Theater in downtown San Antonio. RJ Marquez takes us inside that theater that's being restored to become one of the premier live performance destinations in the city. It's a place where San Antonio witnessed the golden age of Mexican cinema. Antonio Aguilar, Lola Beltran, and the late Vicente Fernandez all performed at the iconic Alameda Theater. When this theater was very significantly built on the west bank of San Pedro Creek, if you were Latino, you could walk in that front door and you could sit in that front row. The theater opened in 1949, but has been closed for decades. A $37 million facelift is now underway to give the Alameda back its shine. The theater is, is being converted from a cinema to a performing arts center, but it's ultimately being restored back to its original glory from when it opened in the 1940s. After a construction delay due to the pandemic, phase two of the project is set to begin soon with the city and county providing a combined $14 million to complete funding for this massive renovation. The Alameda Theater is now set to be open in early 2024. The theater, the performance halls, the amenities, the marquee, the neon lights, those are all going to be restored. The project also includes keeping some of the original art that made the Alameda so unique, a movie palace dedicated to Spanish language films and the performing arts. All the original design elements and amenities that were part of this project are being preserved and restored, including some of the blacklight murals that are in the theater itself. Our goal is to make this the uh, best Latino performing art theater in the United States. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. 
Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. It's a nice sunset out there. Maybe yeah. Good rain, chilly temperatures over the weekend, leading to a beautiful start to the holiday week. Yeah. Just wait, though. I know. Changes are afoot. I know. Oh, they're slowly happening and get ready for the temperatures to ramp up throughout the week. 46 earlier this morning and then 59 for the high temperature. That's below average by five degrees, but we'll be well above average in terms of our afternoon readings in just a few days. And for the most part, we are in the upper 50s to lower 60s. Uvalde had a high of 61, pleasant, pleasant and topped out at 63. Right now, numbers mostly into the 50s. 54 Kerrville and Gonzalez, 57 in Hondo, 61 meanwhile in Catula, but that's one of the outliers. 57 Divine and 56 Canyon Lake. So falling through the 40s this evening, tomorrow morning, some upper 30s, near 40 degrees in the morning. And then we're talking much warmer temperatures by Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We'll tell you how warm in just a bit. Welcome back. Very busy night, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. The Bernie Police Department is changing how it helps people who are in crisis. So tonight, you're going to meet the department's first mental health police officer, and you're also going to hear how she's hoping to use her background to have a greater impact. Also, you know, we got to talk about them. Scammers, they are out in full force this holiday season. So how are they taking advantage of people now? Well, fake QR codes. So we're going to show you how to protect yourself. Also, in a few days, we're going to see our loved ones for the holiday, but we're also worried about the Omicron variant. Tonight, we're going to tell you how it's different from other COVID variants and what you need to look out for to stay healthy. And that is all tonight for you on The Night Beat. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Well, working from home has changed the way that many people commute or don't commute. Yeah. Those changes reflected in the latest rankings of the state's most congested roads. Samuel King joins us now. Sam, experts say more telework doesn't necessarily mean less congestion in the long run. That's right, Stephen Meyer. One reason is the state's major metro area con areas continue to grow very quickly, including San Antonio. But in the meantime, the pandemic meant that some San Antonio roadways actually slipped in the annual rankings. US 281, uh, I-10, parts of 410, 1604, and, and 35 North, where a, a lot of trips are made into San Antonio for work, um, weren't happening. David Trank is a senior research scientist at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. He says changing commute patterns are a big reason why some San Antonio corridors slipped in the statewide rankings this time around. Loop 1604 between 281 and I-10 held steady at 35th, but 35 between 1604 and 410 on the northeast side went from 29th to 38th. 410 from 281 to I-10 slipped from 33rd to 49th. 281 on the north side had a big drop too, from 26th to 52nd. While San Antonio roadways fell out of the top 30 overall, there is one roadway that made the top 25 when it comes to truck traffic, and that's I-35 between Loop 1604 and 410. Experts say it highlights the need for more capacity on this roadway. Anything we can do to smooth those flows, to get the trucks um, either separated somewhat from the um, auto trips, or just to make everything work better and safer is going to improve um, traffic and performance in, in the San Antonio region. And as we told you earlier this month, construction begins next year on a project to build express lanes on 35 on the northeast side. And speaking of I-35, Laredo saw more roads make the congested list this year. Actually, six of them. Shrank said this likely because that area has fewer people who could do their jobs from home and truck terminals are busier because of the demand for deliveries. Well, we're going to look at Loop 410 uh, this evening on the north side. This is a uh, 410 at McCullum. We've had this uh, issue here uh, for a little more than an hour now. You can see uh, that traffic there uh, on Loop 410. So let's take a look there. You can see we had a crash earlier. So westbound 11 minutes between 281 and I-10. Five minutes. Again, this was one of those busy stretches of roadways. We did have a crash at 35 southbound of division. It was just cleared here in the past uh, 10 minutes or so. So you'll see this gap uh, fill in, but we still have some major uh, delays. Looking at the rest uh, of the region, have some issues on 1604. Also have some issues on 35 on the northeast side between the northeast side and New Braunfels. 
52 minutes now between New Braunfels and Loop 410. It uh, wasn't as busy as it usually is at 5, but it's a little busy right now at 6. So if you need to head out, maybe uh, wait maybe 15, 20 minutes, let some of this traffic clear, guys. All right, thanks, Sam. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying above Travis Park here. The ice rink down there, lots of people enjoying it. And it is active tonight. Look at that. Yeah, thankfully, this is a mostly all weather ice rink because we've got so <laughs> many changes coming our way. Yeah, more suiting today to be out there ice skating, you know, especially with temperatures falling off so quickly tonight and things are going to be changing as we approach Christmas. Let's just talk about morning low temperatures tomorrow morning. We'll have some 30s out there, but I think around San Antonio close to 40 degrees. Notice how we just gradually and incrementally get a little bit warmer and then by Christmas morning near 60 to start the day. And we'll take a look at the high temperatures in just a second. Let's get a look at the situation right now. Currently we're at 51 with a dew point of 40. And usually that dew point's an indicator of just how cool it can get at night. So we're anticipating near 40 uh, late tonight and early tomorrow in this set in this situation. Across the state, a lot of 50s out there right now. 57 in Hondo, 58 Uvalde, Fredericksburg 55. Austin down to 48 right now. Meanwhile, Catula at 61. So tomorrow morning, we'll have some areas in the 30s. Uvalde, Hondo, and the Hill Country could dip into the 30s briefly. I'm thinking closer to 40 degrees, though, for the temperature around San Antonio at sunrise tomorrow. Then by the afternoon, well into the 60s tomorrow. Even 70 degrees closer to the Rio Grande. Carrizo Springs, Catula, Del Rio, 71. Canyon Lake 66 along with Gonzales and I really think for the most part we'll just be in the mid 60s locally but getting into the upper 60s Elmendorf and uh, Von Army area. Look what happens though. We get into the 80s by Christmas so we gradually warm up and these afternoon temperatures make it up to 80 on Friday Christmas Day 83 degrees. If you're curious, the warmest Christmas on record was 90 degrees back in 1955. I believe that was so 90 degrees is the record for the day on Christmas. Dew points low for now, and we're not going to see a huge and quick resurgence of moisture and mugginess, but you will notice a hint of humidity in the air. Uh, in later on this week and into the upcoming weekend. And also I do anticipate with the longer nights this time of year. I mean, the winter solstice is tomorrow morning around 10 a.m. We'll have more fog developing as we see a little increase in in the dew points and the humidity. So a lot of dew and some fog ahead of us later on this week with a slight increase in humidity. The upper level system that brought us some activity over the weekend, along with the cold front that, uh, of course, helped instigate some of our showers on Saturday. But then we had this upper level system that helped out a bit. And you see that swirl in the upper levels, basically over Texarkana. That's moving out of here, moving away from us, pushing all that moisture away from us. We needed the rain. It was good to get it. We had just under an inch at the airport in San Antonio, but some other locations had over an inch. Well, <laughs> at least it came because look at this. We're looking at 0% chance every day through the weekend and even on into the early part of next week for at least the next seven days. Not even a chance of a sprinkle or a light shower or anything. Just that morning dampness from fog that is more of a nuisance and doesn't really add up to anything. So tomorrow, a little bit of fog, not as much as what we're expecting later in the week. 40 degrees in the morning, well into the 60s by the afternoon. And we get into Wednesday, Thursday. We talked about those mornings warming up, still comfortable and not bad. But those afternoons, back to 80 degrees. If you like a warm Christmas, looks like this is going to be your year. 83, the high temperature with a lot of sunshine. You know, it, the way to look at it is no matter what the kids get, they can go outside at any time and play with it on what, Christmas Day. What if you don't like a warm Christmas? You're going to have to travel farther <laughs> northward. Mm, well, uh, Greg Simmons is happy about it. <laughs> he is happy a, about it. a happy dance. It, and I'm guessing uh, Myra's not thrilled about it because she didn't say anything. She just went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't like so, it. So there you but go. But I'm happy Greg's happy. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I tell you who we're happy for UTSA Roadrunners yeah. because they're in position now to win their first ever bowl game. Have a very good chance to do that. That's why we've been with the Roadrunners all week long. We're still with them today, and our Larry Ramirez is live from Frisco here in just a moment. And if defense wins championships and the Cowboys are on the right track, coming up.
The UTSA Roadrunners will be hoping to add the Tropical Smoothie Cafe Frisco Bowl trophy to their collection. That was on display today before tomorrow's big game against San Diego State, where the Roadrunners are three-point underdogs, even though they have a better record than the Aztecs and won the conference championship. With more from the Roadrunners' final press conference before kickoff tomorrow, let's take you live to Frisco, and that's where we find our Larry Ramirez. Hello, Greg, and good evening, everybody. You know, the Roadrunners held one final walkthrough today at Toyota Stadium right behind me as they get ready to take on the San Diego State Aztecs tomorrow night. Now, the walkthrough was closed to the media, but earlier today they held the final Frisco Bowl press conference, and we were allowed in there where we talked with Coach Trailer, Rashad Wisdom, and Frank Harris, both players rocking a cowboy hat, a bowl game gift given to every player on both teams. Now, this also gave us a chance to ask Rashad Wisdom about running back Sincere McCormick not playing in this game to focus on going pro. They've been friends for a very long time and have played in countless football games together. I'm happy for Sincere. I'm proud of him. Um, you know, he made his own decision and, um, you know, I'm backing him regardless of what, what it, whatever it is. And, you know, this is going to be the first time I won't be playing with Sincere for in the first, you know, for about eight years now so it's gonna be crazy so you know i love him to death so i can't wait to see what he does up there and i know he's gonna uh you know do what we all expect him to do so happy for him for sure sincere entering the draft is certainly very exciting and hey remember you can get all of our utsa frisco bowl game coverage right now on ksat.com we've been with them since day one greg back to you Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Thank you, Larry. The Dallas Cowboys defense has done something they haven't done since the mid-90s. That scored four takeaways in each of their last three games. The latest against the Giants in New York, where it included three interceptions and one forced fumble in the 21-6 victory. Demarcus Lawrence played his best game since breaking his foot. He rushed on the Giants. Quarterback Mike Lennon and enforced the interception by Jordan Lewis. That would lead to a 13-yard touchdown by Ezekiel Elliott. Lawrence, by the way, would then force a fumble by punching the ball out of Saquon Barley's arm. Arms that would lead to one of three Greg Zerline field goals in the first half. Then Lawrence teamed up with Neville Gallimore in just his second game back from a dislocated elbow, stopping the Giants on fourth and one, leading to Dak Prescott's touchdown pass to Dalton Schultz. And finally, Trayvon Diggs would pick up his 10th interception of the season after this catch was challenged successfully, and the Cowboys win their 10th game of the season and wait to clinch their first playoff burst since 2018. It's amazing. Uh... Just to be on the team with a, a strong defense, uh, you don't get no better than that. Uh, you know, just trying to beat the offense and, uh, you know, touchdowns now. Next up, a rematch of the Washington football team on Sunday Night Football in the Cowboys' AT&T Stadium. The Houston Texans won their third game of the season and their second against the Jacksonville Jaguars, a team in turmoil after their head coach Urban Meyer was fired last week. It was the first win ever as an NFL starter for rookie quarterback Davis Mills, who threw for two touchdowns, both to Brandon Cooks, in the 30-16 victory. Brandon had a great day, obviously. Two touchdowns, over 100 yards. Uh, been, I mean, extremely consistent all year, and that's why... He's very easy as a target to find because you know he's going to be in the right spot at the right time. All right, up next are the Texans, the L.A. Chargers, Sunday at noon in NRG Stadium. Don't forget the Spurs play tonight in L.A. against the Clippers. Highlights for you tonight on the night beat. Looking forward to that game. All right. Thank you, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is next. Our collective health has been in such sharp focus throughout this pandemic, but for some people, health is often determined by where they live or their race or ethnicity. In today's KSAT Q&A, we are joined by Dr. Lisa Ochoa, founder of San Antonio Endovascular Clinic, a vascular surgeon here in our community. Dr. Ochoa, thanks for being here uh, with us today to explain this. So you, you deal with health disparities. You see them all the time. What are the differences and the impacts to people that you see based on where they can get health care? That's a, a great question. And so as a vascular surgeon in San Antonio, I take care of all blood vessel problems. But one of the most common things I treat is peripheral arterial disease. And that's the buildup of cholesterol and plaque in the blood vessel that blocks blood flow to the legs. And in our diabetics, who are two to three times more likely to have this disease process, end up in diabetic amputations. And so when I first moved to San Antonio, I learned quickly that one of those objective healthcare outcomes like diabetic amputations varied very differently from the north side of San Antonio and the south. And if you look at even the deep west, 78207, 78237 and south side, 
We have zip codes in San Antonio that hit three times the rate of diabetic amputations compared to zip codes on the north side. And that was one of the first encounters I had with realizing disparities and how we end up with these kind of healthcare outcomes. That's a result of many different things, but one thing we can look objectively is just simple, like you mentioned, access to care, the number of clinics, of hospitals, of doctors that you can actually visit on the south or deep wet side versus the north side. And that itself, there's a profound disparity. And my practice focuses in those zip codes, the highest diabetic amputation rates, while hopefully we have a bigger impact in those populations. Insurance also an issue in all of this health insurance, whether people have it or not. And, and, and what can we do to make that better? I mean, how can we improve the situation? And I'm guessing it's a situation that's just been accentuated with the pandemic and COVID and all of that going on. You're exactly right. Um, access to health insurance is also access to care. If you don't have health insurance, you can't access the clinic down the road or, or the hospital. With the pandemic, we had more people lose jobs and because a lot of insurance, health insurance is, is job based, they've lost their insurance. One of the things I think we all know that in Texas, we have not expanded Medicaid and that alone would increase the, uh, it, the amount of people who can be insured. But even now, and this is another part of the disparities, there are many, many people in these areas that qualify for stuff like Medicaid or county health insurance or can go to federally qualified health care centers. But because they also don't have the access to that health information and the guidance to go through that process, which can be complicated, even those that could have some kind of insurance or funding don't have access to it because of that barrier alone. You've talked about how this is not a new problem for South Texas or San Antonio. There's a history of these disparities in our community. There is a history of these disparities. And if you look at a red line map of 1930 San Antonio, where the red line areas after the Great Depression, when certain areas were valued, those red line areas are minority populations, are Hispanic populations, African American populations. And it's interesting if you look at a red line 1930s map side by side with today's diabetic amputation rate map or access to internet or access to healthcare or asthma exacerbations, those maps look the same. So that tells me that the intentional inequities or segregation that happened decades ago still have an impact on us today. Should it? Is, do there need to be incentives to have more physicians and clinics and things like that in, like you said, the deep west side and then the south side of the city? I mean, is that part of the solution on all of this? You're exactly right. How do we encourage physicians to come? And how do we keep the physicians that we are training in San Antonio in these areas? I, I do believe that if we can incentivize them with maybe an uh, easier tax rate or incentives to get their loans paid off, I know we have those incentives in rural areas, but the outcomes in these urban areas in the south side and the west side had similar outcomes to some rural areas. So if we could create some of those financial incentives for independent physicians to set up their own practice, that would be great. And you know, the fact that we have UHS that has bought some land on the south side near Texas A&M and building a county hospital on the south side, I think that's another step forward. And if we can prioritize that to hopefully kind of meet these inequities that have been going on for decades and decades, if we can make that a priority, then I think we can begin to make some strides in access to care. Yeah, we are seeing some of our hospital systems move into underserved areas or in rural communities that don't have that same access that we do here in town. What, what's your advice to a, a patient or somebody who may live in one of these communities you're talking about, the west side, the south side? They're hearing this and wondering how the place that they call home is going to impact their health. What would you tell them? So I would tell them one is understand exactly what is going on from a health care aspect in your community. And I think they live it. They know it. They just haven't acknowledged that. And then realize that they have control over what's in their community on how much they invest in the local community, as well as vote. You know, their vote is their voice. And so whether it's on a local election, a countywide election, a statewide election, I encourage our West Siders and our South Siders who I think typically don't feel they have a voice, this is your voice. Uh, to ask for all those resources that will serve your community, that will serve your children, and hopefully lead to more prosperity for all these families. Dr. Cho, before I let you go, you and I talked about a year ago uh, about 
some of what we're talking about tonight, but also uh, you talked about the fact that there are a lot of people that need to come in and get their circulation checked that have diabetes that have some of these high risk things going on and they just weren't showing up because of fear of COVID and fear of the pandemic. Is that still playing out today in San Antonio? See, that, that's a great, great question. The answer is yes. What I was finding was that patients were not coming in for the routine vascular exams. We know that patients with diabetes are at high risk for peripheral arterial disease. And when we don't monitor that and progresses rapidly, it can really lead to ulcers or wounds that don't heal. Across America during this pandemic, we saw an increase of about 50% of diabetic amputations. And so making sure that our diabetics know that they need their circulation checked, even if they have no symptoms, at least yearly is very important. And not to miss those appointments with your vascular doctor. Dr. Lisa Ochoa with San Antonio Endovascular Clinic. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Take care. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Just a couple of construction reminders. Uh, Loop 1604 to the northwest side between I-10 and Bandera. Some alternating lane closures through uh, the 23rd this week. Not much construction, if any, over the Christmas weekend. We'll have more on that later in the week. Uh, also some lane closures overnight on in the Loop 410 area on the northeast side, Austin Highway. Uh, you, they're doing some uh, geotechnical and drilling work there, so you might see some road crews already seeing some delays there at, as 410 meets at 35. Looking at the uh, rest uh, of the area, I have a couple of crashes, including one there uh, on the north side near the airport, and we've been watching uh, that. Also, uh, 410 in Fredericksburg westbound, a little bit of a delay, 11 minutes now between uh, I-10 and 151, seven minutes going the other way. This is how uh, that looks here on Transguide 410 at Fredericksburg. You can see uh, there on the uh, shoulder there, the left shoulder, you can see the crash. And we have one more crash to show you. Been watching this one for a little bit. This is 1604 at uh, Shanefield on the west side. Uh, those cars have been there on the shoulder, slow going there too this evening. So just watch out for that if you're heading out and about. Steve Meyer. All right, thanks, Samuel. Let's take a look outside. Sun is down at this point, still a chill in the air, 52 degrees, but that chill is not going to last too much longer. No, and I'm curious, Adam, is this like, we're gonna see a warm Christmas? Yeah, we're gonna see a warm Christmas. Is more of the country seeing a warm Christmas than not everybody? Just a South Texas thing. And up the plains a bit, because yeah. there is some cold air out there, and there's gonna stay some, you know, the cold air is gonna be staying up to the north. It's just gonna be locked in place farther to the north while our air modifies and we warm up this week 51 degrees right now by 10 o'clock mid 40s and tomorrow morning I think most of us right around 40 degrees we have some patchy fog to talk about a look at where we are rain wise this year it's hard to believe the year is coming to an end we'll take a look at our situation the latest drought monitor and rain chances as well coming up If you missed getting your packages in the mail, your time is up. The cutoff to send presents was today for most services, but there are a few options for those who still need to send gifts. Yeah, for shipping UPS, you have a December 21st deadline for the three day select service when shipping in the US. If you're shipping FedEx Express, you can buy yourself some more time. Deadlines there start tomorrow and end December 24th for same day delivery. Those are gonna cost you though a little bit more. Of course. But yeah. How about deadlines on shopping? How, how you guys doing? Plenty of time um, left. I actually Plenty went. I, okay, I went shopping yesterday, and I think I was followed by a guy in a Grinch costume. I don't know if you saw it on social media, but oh there was a guy, there was a guy who just like showed up in a Grinch costume, and then everywhere I went, he was there. And I'm like, is this telling me? Am I the yeah. only one seeing this? this am I like having, Yeah. What's what's happening? Yeah. So it was interesting. That's odd. Yeah. I thought, I thought that was a little you, you odd thought, too. Yeah, I would, I would too. Thought oh. I was stuck in Whoville. <laughs> <laughs> Not as cold as Whoville this week. It's no. going to be warming up, and yeah, the weather's going to be just fine to do any last-minute preparations. We all know who we are. Yeah. <laughs> this week it's going to be okay. Uh, good weather out there, comfortable conditions, and nothing to get in the way weather-wise of uh, activities coming up for Christmas and the holidays. So patchy, patchy morning fog, especially later in the week. Warming up, of course, 80 degrees for Christmas is what we're looking at. So warming up for sure. But let's talk about rainfall in our situation right now. We had just under an inch of rain 
over the weekend measured at the airport. Of course, some other parts of town had a little bit more and even a little bit less. So so month to date so far for the month, 0.9 inches, so nine tenths of an inch, and that's about four tenths of an inch below average. But year to date since January 1st, we're at over 34 and a half inches of precipitation, and that's nearly three inches above average. So overall for the year, it, we look like we're in good shape, but right now we do have some areas of drought, especially west of 281. And the closer you get to the Rio Grande, we get into the deeper drought and 58% of Texas now considered in drought. We've slowly been falling into drought. So obviously we could use some rain. We did get some rain over the weekend and that drought monitor does not take into account the recent rainfall. The new monitor will be out on Thursday that does take it into account. But the upper level swirl that helped bring some of the showers over the weekend. That's over Texarkana right now moving out of here. So you see all the rain and precipitation with it basically moving through Mississippi and parts of the southeastern US along with Arkansas right now that's exiting and now we're settling into a very quiet weather pattern for the next several days. You know, we've been in a trend where we'd see these big upper level lows dropping into the western US and they could come our way right now. We're not seeing that and it looks like there's no sign of any real active weather or good chances of rain for at least the next seven days. At least colder air is out there. It's not frigid. It's just colder. I mean, 20s North Platte and Omaha teens, Bismarck and Minneapolis. So there's some cold, colder air off to the north. It's just staying bottled up to the north and not really plunging southward anytime soon. Not going to make it here at least right now. 52 in Carrizo Springs, Fredericksburg at 50. New Braunfels 53, Catula at 61 and Del Rio now at 63. Tomorrow morning we'll have some areas in the 30s, dropping down into the mid 30s, Uvalde, Hondo, Kerrville, Rock Springs, but I think closer to 40 degrees around San Antonio. By tomorrow afternoon, well into the 60s and even right around 70 degrees farther west of town. You get closer to the Rio Grande and south down I-35, probably about 71, 72 degrees for the high temperature in the afternoon. But there's that upswing. We keep just working our way upward. And by Christmas Eve, Friday, about 80 degrees. Saturday, we'll start the day near 60 and then be 83 into the afternoon. Not much humidity out there. Dew points in the 40s right now, and we'll see a little increase in the mugginess later this week. You'll notice a hint of humidity by Thursday, Friday. I think that's going to lead to thicker morning fog later on in the week and then the afternoon sun. So tomorrow, just a hint of fog in the air in the morning, then sunny, not too humid, not much of a breeze near 40 in the morning, 60s in the afternoon and then Christmas Day. I do think will be 83 degrees, so you may want to leave um, an ice water for Santa along with the uh, <laughs> along with the milk and cookies. Yeah, kind of ironic. The Christmas tree is setting on the sun <laughs> yeah. for the Saturday 83 degree Christmas for maybe a Gatorade for Santa. There that you would go. Be nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. in case you missed it coming up next. Ooh. Here's today's in case you missed it. It is Monday, December 20th. It's life in prison for a man who was found guilty in the death of an 11 month old boy. Miguel Gutierrez was sentenced this morning. Now, last month he was convicted for the death of Xavier Cortez. That baby died in 2017, while that man that we just told you about was babysitting him. Paramedics testified that when they arrived at the scene, little Xavier was unresponsive, had bruises on his torso. Today, the baby's step grandfather read a letter to Gutierrez. It came from the baby's father who's in jail on unrelated charges. I'm glad to know you're going to be put away for a long time and no one else has to be scared of you doing that again. Police are looking for the person who shot a man outside of a downtown club. Happened last night around 1130 near Heat Nightclub on North Main Street. Police say that two groups of people got in a fight inside the club and then they took it outside. Investigators say that someone was driving by in a vehicle and opened fire. That bullet hit a worker from that club. He was hurt in the leg and now police are looking through surveillance footage to try and find that shooter. In Lubbock, police searching for a suspect after shots were fired at South Plains Mall last night. Police say one person was grazed, another person suffered minor injuries while trying to get away. Shoppers were briefly locked down in stores, then evacuated from the area. 
Police are continuing their investigation this morning. So far, no suspects are in custody. More workers around the country in for a raise in the new year. 21 states and 35 cities and counties across the country are set to bump their minimum wage on or around New Year's Day. The federal minimum wage still at $7.25 an hour, right where it has been since 2009. Still some delays on uh, 35 southbound coming out of New Braunfels into San Antonio. 44 minutes between uh, New Braunfels and uh, Loop 410, including there by 1604. Also have a crash there in the north side near the airport still uh, on the board. We told you about that a little bit earlier, that construction. Uh, they are trying to get to the trains guide view here, and that is not going to cooperate. But there you go. Also have still have some crashes there. 1604 Chainfeld and Loop 410 at Fredericksburg Adam. Not as much red on your map right now as it was earlier. And not as bad. All right, so tomorrow morning, right near 40 degrees, some patchy fog, then sunny, low humidity, beautiful day, mid 60s. Baby blue sky. We warm up a bit. We'll have, I think, thicker morning fog, especially by Wednesday and particularly Thursday. Up to 80 degrees by Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Right now, we're expecting about 83. Feeling the warmth. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you after the game on the night beat.